In India, water is a is a big problem. And a lot of the deals that we had coming through our desk were focused on like water filtration, but nobody was looking at the water sensing market. And in order to properly filter the water, in order to properly treat the water, you kind of need to know what's wrong with it. And so when we started looking at the water sensing market, we realized that there was a really wide spectrum. It was really expensive technology that was upwards of $10,000, or people were using test strips that had a lot of human error baked into it. And so there was really nothing that was autonomous that was priced in a reasonable price range that could actually tell people what was wrong with their water. And so that was what we set out to build initially, tried selling it to the Indian government, stupidest idea a startup can have because the Indian government is riddled with red tape. There's a lot of um, people to go through, a lot of kind of hoops to jump. And so we came back to the US and flipped the model around to swimming pools. My dad used to have a chain of pool and spa supply stores. And so I just flipped the model around. I said, what if we sell the technology to wealthy pool owners, use the money to then reinvest the technology, make the product robust in swimming pools, and then go into agriculture, drinking water, food and beverage later. You come across way more burdens and barriers than you otherwise would um, in walking down a straight path. But if I was to say the most difficult part of first starting off is actually figuring out what to work on and more importantly, what to not work on. Because when you first start, you have the world of possibility, the world of probability, right? You can, you can work on anything because I could, in designing the best sensor, spend seven years in R&D at a university figuring out how to make a carbon nanotube or I can take something that's off the shelf and put it inside of a device, right? So the question really becomes like, what do you work on? But more importantly, what do you not work on? Um, prioritization is kind of the hardest thing to focus on when you first launch. Um, I am the founder of a company called Sutro. Um, we are doing a water diagnostics robot, and that's what uh, we make today. But uh, how do I define myself? That's like a very uh, philosophical question, actually. I don't, you know. I guess I could physically describe myself too, but that's uh, that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm curious about your journey in this, um, yeah, designing Satoru, the, the, the device to monitoring for home, then swim pools and military application. I'm just curious about the beginning of this journey. If you can tell me how it all started till now. Yeah. Um, so I was actually an associate at a venture capital fund in India when I first came up with the idea for Sutro. Um, in India, water is a, is a big problem. And a lot of the deals that we had coming through our desk were focused on like water filtration, but nobody was looking at the water sensing market. And in order to properly filter the water, in order to properly treat the water, you kind of need to know what's wrong with it. And so when we started looking at the water sensing market, we realized that there was a really wide spectrum. It was really expensive technology that was upwards of $10,000 or people were using test strips that had a lot of human error baked into it. And so there was really nothing that was autonomous that was priced in a reasonable price range that could actually tell people what was wrong with their water. And so that was what we set out to build initially, tried selling it to the Indian government, stupidest idea a startup can have because the Indian government is riddled with red tape. There's a lot of um, people to go through, a lot of kind of hoops to jump. And so we came back to the US and flipped the model around to swimming pools. My dad used to have a chain of pool and spa supply stores. And so I just flipped the model around. I said, what if we sell the technology to wealthy pool owners, use the money to then reinvest the technology, make the product robust in swimming pools, and then go into agriculture, drinking water, food and beverage later. Mm -hmm. And me catch up with the, the most challenging part when you started. It's still a challenging. You really maybe can highlight about the startup journey. But what most challenging thing maybe beyond the design and maybe the iteration you have been going through and the shape of the design as well. I think it's really impressive that we have a compact design because we speak about how you can make a design appealing for customer, compact, durability, battery, all this kind of thing is in the design and coming up with a price for the user. Can you tell about this journey and what's most challenging one that you maybe almost giving up in it? I'm not sure if that happened to you. I mean, it, it happens to all startup founders many times. I feel like uh, people, you come across way more burdens and barriers than you otherwise would um, in walking down a straight path. But if I was to say the 
most difficult part of first starting off is actually figuring out what to work on and more importantly, what to not work on. Because when you first start, you have the world of possibility, the world of probability, right? You can, you can work on anything because I could, in designing the best sensor, spend seven years in R&D at a university figuring out how to make a carbon nanotube, or I can take something that's off the shelf and put it inside of a device, right? So the question really becomes like, what do you work on? But more importantly, what do you not work on? Um, prioritization is kind of the hardest thing to focus on when you first launch. In terms of pricing, market adoption, everything you say, um, you kind of asked about, all of that starts to become clear when you start to figure out what you're working on, what you're not working on. So for example, if I was making something that was an in-pipe device versus a floating device, we would probably price it higher. If I was using technology that was custom designed R&D versus something that was off the shelf, it would be priced differently. If we were targeting a market that was going to hotels like the Bellagio in Las Vegas versus somebody's backyard pool in Texas, again, a different pricing, a different form factor, a different way to do it. Like I said, figuring out who you're selling to, what you're working on, why you're working on it, and basically eliminating as much as you possibly can to get to kind of that focus of who is the market, how you're going to sell it, what's the price point, gives you a better understanding of how to actually tackle those issues versus you tackling everything all at once. I can give you a bit of technology about the store in mid details, like how, how it work, if it's possible for audience, uh, the details. Yeah. So we use a, um, a liquid reagent system. We use liquid, liquid assays. Um, the liquid reagents are the exact same that you would otherwise use for water testing. That's certified by the EPA. Um, so if you are around a swimming pool, own a swimming pool, you probably are familiar with phenol red that measures the pH chemical. Um, you might be familiar with DPD, which measures chlorine. You might be familiar with an alkalinity titrant or sulfuric acid, which you use to measure alkalinity. The technology itself uses these off-the-shelf reagents, and what we do is take what you otherwise would have in a swimming pool, which is a test kit that's probably about the size of my finger, respectively, and we shrink it down to something that's the size of your fingernail. So we have a 1 to 50, 1 to 50 reduction of size, and that's how we fit everything elegantly into that little form factor that you see. The Technology has a cartridge. Inside the cartridge are these liquid reagents that are fit inside of one milliliter syringes. And the real IP is around this microfluidic chip that's at the top of the, of the cartridge that actually doses 1 50th um, the amount of a reagent into a flow cell with about, one, um, about 200 times water. What we then do is we basically use a CCD or computer vision to actually shine a light across and measure what the absorption is. And based off the absorption, we send all that information to the cloud. We have machine learning and a little bit of AI that actually begins to figure out what the pH of the water is. And then based off of what that pH is, we tell you what to do with the water. So what chemicals to put inside, how to turn the pH up or lower. Um, and that's all done into, in our cloud with an iOS or an Android app. And so that's kind of how the, how the technology works from end to end. Mm -hmm. And it's a subscription model or a, how, how it works now? When you purchase a device, it's, you make a subscription as well besides the, the hardware. I'm just curious about this point. Because sometimes people say you should have the, the software and, and hardware at the same time. There's a lot of question here, but I'm curious what the business model looks like here. Yeah, we do have a subscription. Um, the software, in a sense, is, I, I guess, free. Um, we charge for the cartridge, right? So the cartridge is either $29, uh, $29 or $39 a month. For the $39 a month, we do have a little bit of software that kind of changes, but um, overall we have to cost for that physical piece of plastic that has the liquid reagents inside because those get used as you're using the actual sensor. So we have to we, we have to replenish that. And so there's a physical thing that gets mailed to your house every single month. Mm -hmm. So for the customer, you see the swimming pool, like for example, in military, are you planning to expand more? Can you tell me about when you think about your company every day, I think it's very challenging to think about scale it and maintain it every day. Can you tell me about your vision here and our and expanding or scaling for more users beyond what you mentioned? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at where we started the company from, which was with drinking water. 
right? And we zoomed out to where water is used in any sort of application. So you can ask the question is where is where is water used? Water is used in drinking water, right? Us humans drink the water. Is it treated? You ask that question next. Yes, it's treated. How do you know how to treat that water? It has to be sensed. You have to sense the water chemistry at the drinking water power plant that's in New York, that's in California, that's in Europe. Based off of those people that are providing the water, they have to test the water to make sure it's safe to be drank. Sutra can work there. The next question, where else is water used? It's used to grow our food, right? We use it for agriculture. If you're using water in an agricultural setting, do you need to test water? Yes, because people usually will put fertilizer inside the water through fertilized irrigation to figure out if they're growing tomatoes, lettuce, corn, any of the things we grow today to make sure that the fertilizer in the water is proper for the food that we're growing. Sensing again, right? Sutro can work there. Where else is water used? It's used in the built environment, in our buildings. Cooling water towers and the large high rises use water to basically percolate over. And a big problem there is calcification. Do people test the water in cooling water towers? Yes. So Sutro can be there. Where else is water used? It's used in chip manufacturing. We have all this AI that's going out. NVIDIA needs to make more chips. In chip manufacturing, why is water needed? Because you need clean water to make sure that your chips in the clean room are made properly. Do you test the water to make sure it's clean? Yes. Sutra can work there. Right. So that's kind of how we evaluate market and where our product product is needed because we first look at where there is the largest problem in somebody needing to test the water. And then based off of that, we can go in and figure out how our product actually works. Behind that, obviously, is the entire sales mechanism. How do you get in contact with the right people? How do you price it properly? Um, and those are all questions that we ask. But to your question of how do we scale, that's how we initially think about scaling our technology into different markets. Maybe if you can highlight the most, uh, maybe, hard moment in your company. I, of course, every founder goes through this, and I think it would be nice if you can share about these moments and how we deal with that, especially maybe in the technology-wise, maybe in the investment, whatever, you can you can share all of that. Yeah, that's the funny thing about startups, right, is that every moment from the outside is actually a hard moment because you're you're building something entirely new. And if I was to maybe pick, you know, a few hard moments, um, the first is building hardware, right? It's much easier for software companies to build software versus a hardware company to build hardware and software. We're just, we're literally doing more work with the exact same amount of capital or the same capital pool than a software company is. And if you flip the table around for an investor, it's much simpler to get a better ROI on a software investment because you can layer money on a much cheaper and quicker development cycle than actually making plastic parts or making atoms or, or bits. And so that's, you know, kind of a challenge in itself, which kind of blurs the line between actual product definition as well as investing, right? Those are kind of the two focus areas there. Um, another part part is people, right? Organizations are made by people. People are buying your product. They're your customers. People are funding your company. They're your investors. Um, people are your advisors. And so making sure that you're listening to the right people, you're treating people fairly, you're managing people um, also becomes a very challenging thing because not only are you just building the technology, but you're also managing a whole group of people. Um, and in those people, you can double click into your team, right? There's team dynamics. You can double click into your customers. There's ways to sell to customers. There's personalities. There is um, people that say no to deals. You have personalities of investors that say no to you pitching to them. Like people will have a multitude of problems. Um, then it's just the the challenge of like waking up every morning and doing the same thing over and over again and making sure that you're walking in the right direction, right? Like I said earlier, you have a ton of things you can work on in your startup. And are you working on the right thing, right? That that in itself is a challenge. You wake up every morning being like, is this the thing? Is this the market? Is this the customer we should be focusing on? Um, I can keep going, but that's a, that's, a, that's a handful of them. Yeah, I'm just curious. Did you have a moment of like, why well, I'm doing this? If it's too, you have been doing this for many years. So did you have moments like, why well, I should keep doing that? Is it painful? Like, or it's fun? It's just, you know, it's too much challenging. I don't know. Or it is, it is challenging, which is cool because you get to see your vision come to life. 
Um, but uh, do people ask the question? Of course they do. Of course I did. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you about the vision that, that you have for Zotoro. Like now and maybe in next year, what would you think the, maybe the challenging thing is for you now? Is this just upgrading the product in a certain direction? Or what it is like when you think about the next thing that I have to do? Besides, of course, having satisfied yeah. the customer, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I sold the company in 2019 or 2018 to a large water sanitation company out of Canada um, called Sandy Mark. And so we, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Sandy Mark now. What the plan looks like for the next year is first is obviously solidifying our stronghold in the swimming pool industry, right? We've, we've opened up that market. We exist in the market. How do we make our position in the market stronger? The second is actually Sandy Mark has multiple verticals around food and beverage, around janitorial, right? All the examples that I gave earlier are markets that they sell sanitation into. The question that naturally becomes, we are owned by a large sanitation company. How do we scale into those other verticals? Um, and so those are kind of the two big questions that we're looking at solving in the next year to a few years after that. Mm -hmm. And who are the competitor now for you? Like, do you... Do you believe in competition or not? I'm just curious when you... Of course. There's, if there is a problem, there's there's competition, right? And how do you deal with uh, that? Because sometimes, I don't know if you... I heard that competition for losers sometimes, they say that. Competition is like necessary because if there's a problem and there's multiple people working on it, that means that your market is worth something. Um, you look at the social... The like social market, right? After, before Facebook, MySpace used to exist. Before Google, Yahoo used to exist. Like these aren't... They they do things better, but the general problem of search or social networking is is solved. Um, the iPhone, the iPhone is is isn't it isn't it an establishment or or an encouragement of what an existing phone used to be? Or used to have phones. We used to call people. Um, there's always competition, and if you don't understand who your competitors are, then you're doing your business and the market a disservice because you don't know how to compare yourself against you as a customer looking at the market space. Um, can you define a category of one? Sure. That's a very different proposition than saying that competition's for losers. Um, so to kind of answer your question on who our comp competitors are, it's it's literally the product that we use, right? The, the, the liquid reagents that we put inside of our device to make it smaller is our competitor. People use that technology in a bigger standpoint to test their pools today. There are other smart smart monitors that exist on the market. That's our competition. Um, there's pool guys, right? You can hire somebody to come and test your water for you. That is our competition. And so it just depends how you frame what the market is and what people use for water testing in a, in a, in a very literal sense. Maybe two questions. First one, what is your biggest fear? Like the most thing you're afraid of, maybe in the startup scene here, your biggest fear. I don't think you could be scared of anything because the world is unknown. And uh, what do you think that you would like to achieve in your lifetime? I mean, I would love to provide value for people. And that's kind of like the, the biggest directive that I had. Um, it's the reason that I started Sutro with, with solving a problem for water, right? Because water is a necessary need for humanity. I just want to, yeah, help help the world and help humanity in a positive direction given the kind of frame that we're in today and if there's advice we'd like to share we'd like to share for people listening like especially someone like start something from robotics background mostly audience here but i think it's too related so what kind of advice if you would love to give it to someone listening yeah if you have a problem and you have an idea just do it and and like execute it if you're passionate enough about it keep on doing it. If you want to try to make a few bucks, then go get a job. Awesome. I like that. Yeah. Do, do you have any final words like say maybe for people listening or maybe interested on in connecting with you and the company? So any final words to regarding that? Yeah. Yeah. You can find um, Sutro at mysutro.com, M-Y-S-U-T-R-O.com. And if you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn at Ravi Karani. Um, just put on there that you heard me from Marwa's podcast.